Hi, everyone. Okay, we got one minute to go before we start. So just uh, please bear with us. Uh, the, the event is being live streamed on Facebook as well. So if any of your colleagues are trying to join and they haven't registered, you can just direct them to the Elsevier Africa Facebook page. I'm going to hide these for now. All right. Okay, so the chat box is open for now. So please feel free to chat with each other as we have a little bit of time before we start. But once the session has started, we will disable the chat box so that it does not distract our presenter. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Researcher Toolbox webinar series. My name is Daneshri Murthy. I am a consultant working for Elsevier. I'm based in South Africa. And we, as part of the Africa team, have put the series together to address uh, the most requested topics from researchers in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so today's session is about how to write and review a compelling review article, which is something I'm also quite excited about this session. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, our speaker today is a senior managing trends editor from South Press. His name is Matthew Pavlovich. Matthew has earned his BS in chemical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, where he studied the biological effects of air plasmas. He studied analytical chemistry as a postdoctoral researcher at Northeastern University. Oh, sorry about that. I was effectively removed from Zoom. But um, Matthew, if you want to take over, I hope I've, I wasn't cut off before the end of your introduction. But um, yeah, I'm back. Sure, thanks for the introduction. I think we got most of it. Um, that's fine. We can just go ahead and start the, the talk then. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm excited to talk to you all today about writing review articles. Um, we're going to focus mostly on what makes a good review article um, from the perspective of the author, but I also want to talk a little bit about how to review a review article um, in case any of you are ever interested in writing one, and then you get the reviewer comments maybe to understand what the reviewers are thinking, or um, if maybe your um, advisor or you as an independent uh, researcher get an invitation to review a review, maybe how to think about it. 
I um, hope everybody can hear me okay, and feel free to ask some questions in the Q&A. Um, we're going to get to those toward the end of the talk if we have some time. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the journal that I publish. It's Trends in Biotechnology. This is Cell Press's home for applied biology reviews. It's pretty broad. Um, so if you ask different people, you're going to see different things from what biotechnology is. So some people might think of it as um, more industrial or biochemical engineering. A lot of people are going to see it from a therapeutic perspective with tissue engineering and things like that. Um, we also cover a significant range of omics, multi-omics, applied genetics, um, significantly as applied to in um, agricultural biotech. So with all of these things, this is um, a very broad range again. So we have to think carefully about how we're going to um, cover this broad scope. But the common theme across it is useful applications of biology. And so I like to think of my journal, Trends in Biotechnology, as the leading reviews journal in useful biology. Um, I get asked a lot about different kinds of formats for reviews, and I think this is a great place to start. Um, there's a, some common review formats that we just don't publish in my journal, but I can tell you about them in case you hear these terms. Um, one of them is meta-analysis. You're probably familiar with that. This is um, a qualitative and quantitative, that's the important part, analysis of previously published data. So in a meta-analysis, you're going to have some sort of rigorous analytical methodology. Um, you're probably going to do some hypothesis testing. Different journals might consider this either a research or a review article, and it's kind of like research because you are doing a method and you're applying your own ideas to it, and it's kind of like a review because you're not really doing experiments. Um, the journal that I edit um, at Trends of Biotechnology, we don't publish meta-analysis, but I get asked a lot about it, and so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, another format that's pretty common that we don't publish is called systematic review. So this is, if you're writing a review article, to answer a specific question. And when you see a systematic review, you're going to get these um, database searches, like we found all these articles in Web of Science, um, or Scopus, or PubMed, or whatever. Uh, and these are really characterized by rigorous inclusion criteria, so keyword searches and years of publication, and sometimes um, particular authors. It's a little bit like a meta-analysis, but there's usually not the formal statistics. Um, and this is most common, I think, in health science and social sciences. So if you're looking at the effectiveness of some intervention across different patient groups or something, um, then you probably wouldn't want to write a systematic review. Uh, and last is comprehensive review. So if you've ever read one of these reviews, uh, I won't name journals, but sometimes you'll, you'll read these and they're like 30 pages long and there's 400 citations. Um, the aim here is really to collect all of the relevant research on a particular topic. Uh, this is not the style of, re of a review article that we publish, but again, it's one that's out there. It's one that I get asked about sometimes. So I wanted to bring that to your attention as well. But getting into what the reviews that I'm more familiar with. Um, so Trends in Biotechnology publishes seven or eight of these per month. This is a little bit outdated. We might be up to about 90 per year at this point. We have two main formats called opinion and review. So opinion is where the authors are giving their perspective um, on a particular topic. So they're the experts. They're saying where they think the field is going to go, or they're suggesting best practices, or they're really just trying to stir up a debate or, or even cover controversial topics. I like to say that these should be forward-thinking hypothetical, but not speculative. So you're making a point, but the point still needs to be grounded in the primary literature. That's in contrast to a review, which is a little bit longer. The point of a review is to provide a current perspective on an important topic. Um, reviews are more balanced than opinions. You're not trying to advance your own perspective, but you still need to say something new. And we're going to keep coming back to that, that theme throughout this talk, that a good review article says something new. You should have some sort of reason for writing the review. We also publish a variety of shorter articles in a bunch of different topics. I won't go through these one by one because they're specific to the journal that I'm involved with. Uh, but you can see that we have opportunities to talk about sort of science adjacent things, ethics, funding, philosophy, um, intellectual property, law, but also to for people to respond to reviews that were written previously or to highlight new research developments they think are especially important. 
When I think of a review, and especially the style of review published at Trends in Biotechnology, but I think this is broadly applicable to review articles in general, um, really what we're looking for is something that's concise. So you're not going to go out there and you're not going to talk about all the details and include every single study that's possible and go into all the mechanisms of everything. We just want you to, to give your point and make it clearly and make it quickly. Um, timely. So we're not going to go back and dig into what people were doing in 2006. Um, we're not going to maybe re-examine a, a body of literature unless there's been some new recent developments. But really, we're looking for what, what are people covering right now? What are the, the active research topics? And then what can we say new about them? Authoritative. So when I think of authoritative, I think of something written by a recognized expert. Um, usually these are professors who have their own labs, who are doing the research, who are involved with the experiments, and therefore can add their own, um, their own experience to the review article. Accessible. This is really important. When you write a review, you might think that you're writing for only people who are interested in the topic, but that's really not true. Uh, reviews are used for education. They're used to introduce new researchers to your topic. Um, they're also read broadly by scientists who want to learn about your topic, even though they might not be active researchers in it. So as you write a review, and this is something else we'll come back to later, um, keep that in mind, that your audience is broad, that you might have people reading it who have never heard of your topic before, and it's really important to get your point across in a way that scientists understand, but people who aren't necessarily experts in your very specific topic of research. And one way that we do this, at least at my journal, is um, thorough editing, as well as a, a series of elements in your article, things like the glossary, that you can use to explain those fundamental details of your field to people outside it. And the last thing is novel. So again, make sure you're saying something new. Um, maybe you're looking at a new field of research or you're examining old data in a new way. But what we really don't want to do is just list a bunch of results, say this group did this, that group did that, without actually incorporating your own ideas into it. And so I'm not going to um, open this up for questions right now, but think about this. So what does authority or experience mean to you? And I think it means different things to different people, um, whether this means people who have published a lot, people who published a lot of high impact works, people who are visible in terms of the community, going to conferences, um, organizing symposia, things like that. Um, maybe people who are active on social media or good communicators and like to engage the audience. I want to wrap up this section with some of my favorite things that we publish, and I'm going to explain why I like them so much. So this is um, on the topic of biofabrication. This is a tissue engineering subject, and this is a new figure of merit that a bunch of the leaders in the field got together and formulated and published that as a review in Trends in Biotechnology. And I like this because they took all of the, the results. You see there's probably, um, probably two dozen different papers cited in just this one figure, and they've compiled it in such a way, and they've looked at the, the results of all these different papers and sorted them by efficiency, which nobody had ever done before. Um, this one is just a schematic, but it's a, it's a synthetic biology. It's about engineering bacterial consortia. And the reason I like this so much is because they've taken these really complex ideas and they've abstracted them into these, you know, these shapes that you can see with the half moons and the triangles and things like that and the arrows, and anybody can look at this figure and appreciate what it's trying to say, even if you don't know very much about synthetic biology or bacterial consortia. Um, this one is literally all of the engineered biosynthetic pathways for natural products in E. coli. It's a few years old, so it might be out of date at this point. Um, the, the impressive thing the authors have done here is every single one of these arrows represents a reaction or an enzyme. And they are published in very different papers. Um, you know, not everybody did all of this in the same bacterium or in the same publication. But what I love about this figure is that the authors of the review read all the papers, figured out what produces what from what enzyme in E. coli, and then established this network map um, based on the entirety of, of what the field is doing. My, my last favorite thing here, so this is another abstraction 
of microfluidic devices for making um, lifelike artificial cells. And so this is a really well done figure by itself, right? You can tell um, they've used consistent colors and labeling for what means what. But the great thing they did was created this movie. And we're going to let this play for a few seconds. It should start. Yep, there it goes. So they've actually gone back to the original papers for all of these articles. And not only did they make an abstraction about what it looks like, they've also put in movies. And we can run that again. Um, for what these microfluidic devices look like uh, as you're looking at them through a microscope. And the reason I love this so much is because this is the sort of thing where if you're trying to get into this field for the first time and you learn about these devices and you can say, okay, well, you know, I can kind of imagine what um, capillary devices look like versus filtration devices, but you don't necessarily know what they look like in person. And I think the authors of this article did a really great job of saying, okay, if you're actually working with this thing in the lab, here's what it looks like. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about why all this matters. Uh, why write a review article? Why is it important to have journals dedicated to reviews? Um, the answer is that scientific output is not slowing down. And I'm going to read you a quote here. It is certainly impossible for any person who wishes to devote a portion of his time to experiment to read all the books and papers that are published. Their number is immense. And so if you, if you reflect on that quote for a little bit, it might be something that somebody could say today, right? I mean, there's so many papers, so many books being published. And as a researcher, if you also want to do experiments, it's really impossible to keep up with every single paper that's published. That was a quote from Michael Faraday um, almost 200 years ago. If you're unfamiliar, Michael Faraday is an um, electrophysicist. He's probably one of the most brilliant physicists of his generation. And if Michael Faraday couldn't do this 200 years ago, um, I don't know if I have any chance of doing it today. So 200 years later, um, there's more than two, 2 million scientific articles published every year. There's more than 30,000 journals at this point. Yet researchers say that they have less time to dedicate to reading papers because they're also doing things like teaching and experiments and mentorship and outreach to the community. Here's just some more statistics um, put together by one of my colleagues at Cell Press. So about 90% of every scientist who's ever lived is alive right now. Um, the global scientific output doubles less than every 10 years. The number of journals published uh, doubles at about every 10 years. There's at least 2,000 different publishers just in science, technology, and medicine. And that's not even including things like the humanities. And there are, um, I think it's closer to, to 25,000 now peer-reviewed journals just in this field. And journals are really important. Um, I'm biased, I'm a journal editor, but I think they're important because they help to organize the community um, through defining scope and through conducting peer review. Um, one, of my, one of my colleagues who's a physicist says that it's a first order signal to noise filter. And what, what he means here is that a journal is a great way of saying, okay, yes, this research has been conducted and it's been peer reviewed and it's been validated in a way that makes you able to trust it. And finally, journals are an important um, way to promote, advocate for research, to lend our voice to the community too. And to add to that, review articles are one step in the process of translating research to common knowledge. And so here I've shown um, um, CRISPR biosensors going from a very specific paper at the top and a very specific CRISPR nuclease and a way of sensing a specific kind of molecule all the way down to the common knowledge of DNA. I'm sure everybody knows what DNA is. You know, you go ask your, um, your uncle and he knows what DNA is. He probably doesn't know what, what a CRISPR biosensor is, but review articles are somewhere in that continuum of saying, okay, here's really novel research. It's a really important topic all the way to eventually it becomes common knowledge. And I think the review is the first step in that process. So why else are reviews useful? Um, we can say they organize, evaluate, and distill information. They're an entry point for students, like I mentioned before, and other non-expert readers. There's a bridge between fields. So sometimes if you have um, disparate fields of research, but they can nevertheless communicate with each other or have something important to contribute to each other, 
A uh, review article is a good way to start that collaboration if you get two authors on the same page. And they can direct and shape future research. So, you know, every good review is going to have a concluding section at the end. Um, some concluding sections are not written in the most interesting way, unfortunately. But I think the best conclusions really say, okay, here's where the field needs to go. And here's the specific experiments that we need to do to get there. Um, and really, I think the best, most influential reviews are ones that actually do shape how the research is conducted from that point forward. So why might you want to write a review? Um, you might think, okay, well, I want to learn about a field, and so I'm going to write a review about it. Um, you can. Uh, it might not be the most insightful one simply because you haven't worked in that topic before. And that doesn't mean it's not useful to put together a list of references, but in terms of organizing them in a way that makes sense and says something, it, you might find this a really difficult uh, exercise. Um, it seems like an easy way to get another line in your CV. It's not. Writing review takes a long time. I mean, it takes months. It takes many revisions, and we'll get into that more in a few minutes. There are some good practical reasons. Um, if you maybe want to demonstrate your expertise in your field, um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me as new professors um, starting their own labs, and they say, okay, here's my vision for my lab's research. Uh, can I write a review to explain it? And I think that's a good reason. Um, review articles do get cited and downloaded, so we like the metrics on reviews. Um, a lot of people will cite them in research papers. A lot of people read them very extensively. And it's also a good opportunity to just reflect on the state of your field of research. Um, maybe take a step back from your experiments, go through the literature, and say, okay, here's what people are doing now. Good reasons, like the ones we just talked about before. But the best reason of all is if you, as an expert in your field, can provide an insight that can't be obtained just from reading the primary literature. If you remember the graph I showed um, a few minutes ago with that figure of merit for efficiency in biofabrication, I think that does a really great job of this. So that's an insight into comparing different techniques that if you just read the papers about one specific technique, you're not going to understand how they all interact with each other. Okay, so here's the, the, the meat of the uh, talk here, the most important part, I think, how to write a review. And we'll talk about how to review a review. So starting off, think about the content. What is your central thesis? Again, I'll come back to this point many times throughout the talk, but what are you trying to say that's new? What's your point in writing the review article? Why does it matter and why does it matter now? So this is getting back to the idea of timeliness. Um, why do we need a new review article in this topic? Um, and what's it going to do for the field? What's the tone and who's the audience? I think these two things go together. Maybe you're writing it specifically for non-experts. You're trying to introduce um, a bunch of biologists to how machine learning works, for instance. Um, maybe this is specifically intended for students or for new researchers in the field. Um, maybe you're pitching it more for experts and you're, you're trying to do a call to action and say, this is how I think this field needs to develop in the future. And finally, is it positioned distinctly from other reviews? Often I get proposals for review articles and there's already 10 recent reviews on that topic. And so my question to the author is invariably, why do we need another review in this subject? What's it going to say that's different from all those other 10 out there? Because again, researchers' time is limited, and they don't necessarily have the resources to read um, all 11 reviews on the, on the subject. So if you're going to write a new one, um, it's really, I think, your responsibility to figure out how it adds to the field. All right, so in terms of the some practical aspects, um, some people and I guess some journals too have the position where you need to be invited or there's some misconceptions about how to get your foot in the door. So I wanna address those. Um, one way that some journals allow it is through direct submission. So if you're gonna write a research paper, you know, you just go to the journal website, um, then you find the link to their submission portal um, at Cell Press, we use something called Editorial Manager, but there's also a bunch of different alternatives out there. Um, and it, you you upload your research article and you press submit and you suggest some reviewers and then you hope the journal likes it. So that's what I'm talking about with direct submission. Um, some journals also allow direct submission for reviews, 
but not all of them. And the one that I edit doesn't. So if you try to log into my submission portal and we haven't talked about your review before, you won't be able to submit it. Um, another way is through editorial invitation. We call these, some, some, a bit of jargon here, we call them commissions. So maybe I really like your talk at a conference, or I read your research paper, and I think it's fantastic, or um, uh, I know you from having reviewed a paper before, I like how you communicate. And so I'm going to say to you, hey, I would really love it if you wrote a review article for my journal. So that's an invitation or a commission. Um, that's one way to, to be able to write a review. The last thing that I'll mention here is unsolicited proposals. So at most journals, even if they're in principle by invitation or commission only, we do consider unsolicited proposals. This is not direct submission. So the way this works here is you're going to email me. Um, this is less formal than actually submitting an entire paper, but you're going to say, hey, I have this idea. Here's what I want to write a review about. Here's why it's interesting. Here's some references I'm going to cite. Here's why it's timely, so on and so forth. Uh, and then that will start a discussion between me and you as a prospective author. This varies from journal to journal. Um, so one thing I don't want you to take away is, okay, this is how it works at the journal that I edit. Therefore, it's how it works at every single journal. So if you're not sure how it works at the journal that you're interested in, just ask the editor. Can I just send the whole manuscript? Um, so some journals are okay with it. I don't like that. Um, we really prefer when you send proposals. And the reason here is because sometimes you write a review article that's really great or that you think is really great, um, but it just doesn't fit what we're looking for. So I've shown here a screenshot of a word count of something that's 12,000 words. Um, if we ask authors to shoot for about 3,500 on initial submission, we're not going to be able to take this on. Even if it's otherwise a good article, it just doesn't fit our scope and it doesn't fit our style. So we don't want you to waste your time on something that's out of scope or out of format. And the, also the editor's job is to help you make the thing that you're writing uh, a good fit for the journal in terms of tone and content. If you've already written the review before you talk to us as editors, then you're not going to let yourself benefit from our expertise. So if you write a proposal, what do you want to include? Um, format for sure. And again, these formats differ depending on the journal. Those are a few that we consider at mine. Um, authors and affiliations seems obvious that some people end up admitting that. Um, summary of the content. So we can consider um, in the form of an extended abstract or an outline. We sometimes ask for a point by point summary. This is just letting us know what you plan on covering um, in the in the manuscript. Why is it timely and why should we care? We talked about this already. So what is this going to add to the field? Um, are there other reviews? Why is yours different? And then finally, what's your personal expertise and what is your novel perspective? So, you know, even if you're not the most established professor, um, even if you haven't led a research lab and you haven't done this for the past 30 years, you might have some unique expertise that you can include. Um, maybe you've taught a course about it. Maybe you've been involved with a um, research consortium, something like that. Um, I might not know that if I don't know who you are, but it's really useful for you to tell that to us. And then finally, some key references. So this is helping us to understand where the field is right now. Uh, what are you going to be citing in your review? And then why is that timely again? You can also include things like figure drafts or legends, um, word count, just to make sure that it's a good stylistic fit, your own publication history. Um, but generally, if I get a proposal for a review, I'm going to look you up on Google Scholar or Scopus or something just to see where your expertise lies. So we'll, you know, we'll be able to find that information. You can include it if you like. Sometimes if you send a proposal, um, the editor's going to say no. Or sometimes at the journals that allow direct submission, um, the editors are going to choose not to send it for review. That doesn't mean that your article or your proposal is bad. Um, there's there's plenty of reasons why we might turn down an otherwise good proposal. Uh, maybe we have other reviews recently published on that topic or that are about to be published. Maybe the field isn't quite ripe enough. Maybe there's like four or five really great research papers in this new burgeoning topic 
um, but it's not enough to make a good review yet. That's okay. Maybe it's not in the right scope for the journal. And in that case, I'll try to refer to my colleagues who it might be a better fit for. Um, maybe we're saving space for invitations. Maybe we think that adding additional authors would help or simply our pipeline is too full to add anything new. I mentioned the pipeline a little bit toward the beginning of the talk. We publish usually seven or eight review articles per month. And that is because I only have a certain amount of bandwidth that I have um, to handle manuscripts, but so does our production staff. And we might get 16 really great proposals. That doesn't mean that we have the time or the energy, frankly, to publish them all. It's not necessarily the end of the line. Um, sometimes you can just revise the aim or the scope. Um, sometimes the editor will encourage you to change the format or change how you're framing the issue. Um, if it's just a matter of too much content in the journal, you can always come back in a few months. Or sometimes it benefits from inviting another co-author um, in case we need to adjust the experience, the expertise rather, um, or add a new perspective. All right, so let's get down to writing. Um, I always like to have a PhD comic somewhere in here. So we're going to procrastinate. We're going to think about how to write. What's this called? All right, we're going to look it up and we're going to procrastinate again. Uh, at some point, though, if you're going to write a review, you really do need to get down to writing it. How do we do that? I think a great idea is to start with an outline. Um, maybe if you went through the proposal route, you already have a point by point summary. Maybe you don't have this yet, but this is a critical first step in organizing your thoughts. Uh, what am I going to do where and when and how? I like about four to six main sections. Um, this is not a hard and fast rule. This is a personal preference. Sometimes you can divide those sections into subsections. Um, usually don't want to divide the introduction or conclusion. This is getting a little bit in the weeds, but I, this is this is sort of my vision for a good review would be a short introduction, probably four or five main sections that are really long and not too long, but um, descriptive and and full of good information. And then a conclusion section that gives your future perspective on the field but you don't wanna chop that up into a bunch of little bits. Um, use parallel structure and headings. So just think about how everything flows together and fits together. Um, you wanna make sure that you're giving enough attention to every aspect of the review. Maybe you have a topic within this field that you really love or that you research yourself and you really wanna get all the references in there and get all the details in there. Um, and then that ends up consuming two thirds of the review and you have to make your other section short. Um, if you start with an outline and you start with, with writing good section headings, you're going to avoid doing that. Um, don't have, you know, four subsections in one section and then one in the next. Um, and then if you sort of zoom out and look at this from the outline, it's going to look silly. You've got a bunch of short paragraphs in one area. You've got a bunch of long paragraphs in the other. Um, just make sure that everything has its due weight um, proportional to how important it is in the literature. All right, yet again, make sure you're saying something new. And this is one of my personal mantras. A review is not a collection of results. Again, a review, not a collection of results. You're saying something new. You're giving readers a new insight that they couldn't find just by reading the papers you cite. So what is that? Um, maybe that's a comparison, um, critique, assessment, including of your own work. You can cite, of course, your own research in a review, um, but you should compare it against what other groups are doing. And maybe, um, okay, this approach looks more promising than that one, or people used to think about this topic this way, but now our understanding has changed. Maybe you're synthesizing different ideas. Um, we'll think back to that example I raised about synthetic biology for bacterial consortia. So there's synthetic biologists and there's bacterial ecologists, but bridging those communities together and saying, here's how we can use SynBio to manipulate the consortia. Um, give actual ideas for experiments. You will not believe the number of reviews I read where in the concluding section, people just say that future work is needed. Well, future work is always needed. Uh, if future work wasn't needed, we wouldn't be publishing articles about this. So you're the expert what future work? Um, if you were the grant funding agency in your field and you could dictate 
all the experiments that everyone in the world did for the next 10 years, what would that look like? Um, if you could bring this to market or commercialize it tomorrow, what would that commercial product look like? Uh, if you could teach this in every high school classroom in the whole country, uh, what would you ask the high school teachers to teach? That's the kind of thing we're looking for in terms of conclusion and future perspectives. Um, this is something that is maybe uniquely interesting to me as an applied biology journal, but path to translation market scale up. Uh, we have all these great things we're developing in the lab and maybe it works at 100 milliliters and maybe to make it industrially meaningful, it needs to work at hundreds of thousands of liters. So how do we get there? Uh, again, you're the expert, maybe you can hypothesize. At the same time, manage reader expectations. So you want to explain why this review is timely, why you've chosen to write the review now. Your review probably will not be exhaustive. Again, you probably can't um, cite every single paper that's ever been published. That's okay. And you probably will not have the only review on the topic. That's okay too. Um, you want to acknowledge that. Um, explain why yours is different. Explain what the, the new angle you're taking. Um, this is not going to be the only authoritative publication in this field. That's fine, but you do need to explain to the readers why they should care about it. And then again, this concluding section. Um, you know, sometimes it's very short. It just says, oh, here's what we demonstrated in the review. That's a summary. That's not really a conclusion. So you've gone through thousands of words here. What have you learned? What do you want the readers to take away? Um, keep that in mind, especially as you're concluding the review. Talk a little bit about consistency and accessibility. Um, please try to avoid jargon and remember that what is jargon to you might not be jargon to somebody else. So the broader the journal scope, the harder this is. Uh, if you ever are fortunate enough to be in the position of writing for something like science and you're writing a review article, um, you know, you have a, an audience from astrophysicists to molecular neurologists. And those things are totally different. And keep in mind that what the astrophysicists know about is not the same thing as what the neurologists know about. Um, I mentioned the glossary is something that we can include um, in the journal that I edit. Other journals do it too. If you have this option, it might not be required, but I strongly suggest taking advantage of it because this is how you can introduce new readers or, or non-experts to the terms that you find important. Uh, make sure your definitions conform with the, the standards in the field. So don't go out on a limb and suggest your own meaning for these things, but, but make sure that it reflects the actual practice of the field. And then make sure that your terms are used consistently throughout the paper. Here's an example of jargon. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but you see things like ligate, proximal, oligotide, nucleotide pairs, uh, primer extend across the single-stranded pairs to record each ligation. If you know a lot about molecular biology, this makes perfect sense to you. Um, if you are a, a tissue engineer who's interested in um, uh, wound repair for human health, you don't know what this means. So this is an actual first draft of a manuscript that I got a couple of years ago. Um, this is fine if you're writing for your own audience. It might be fine for writing a grant. It's not really fine for writing a review for a broad scope journal. Again, you're an expert. Uh, that's why you've been invited to write the review, but don't assume that every reader is as much an expert as you are. Also think about whether your first draft meets the journal's requirements. So there might or might not be some flexibility in terms of the word count and number of references. Um, ask the editor if you're not sure. It's probably safe to assume that if you're 50% over the stated limits, you might need to cut it down. There might be different standards for the initial submission and the revised version. Um, so the reviews that my journal publishes tend to be a little bit longer in publication, in published form, than they are in initial submission. And that's because the reviewers usually ask for more information and not less. And I like to leave a little bit of room for the authors to be able to respond comprehensively to the reviewer comments. Um, some of the minor formatting requirements can be addressed later, but it probably saves everyone time to, to figure it out now. So um, a good example is figure callouts. 
um, before we publish your review, we're going to make sure that all of your figures are mentioned in the text, you know, figure one or, you know, see figure two B or something like that. Um, you can do that at the very end of the process, right before it's published. But if you do it at the beginning, it's going to save the reviewers a lot of hassle and the editor a lot of hassle in trying to figure out what part of the text that figure two B relates to. Um, and the, the, the level of copy editing and typesetting that you get for accepted manuscripts can vary by journal. So um, Trends in Biotechnology is a really sort of high service, high touch kind of journal, we call it. Um, there's really thorough editing, both on the editorial side and the copy editor side. Uh, our typesetting is beautiful. Everything looks nice. Uh, and some journals that publish higher volumes don't really have the ability to do that for every single article. And so there might not be a typesetter or copy editor that catches these little tiny things. So I would suggest doing it now, even if you might also have the option to do it later. Okay, so you've got a first draft. Awesome. You've done most of the hard work at this point, but you're not quite finished yet. Uh, read it again. Don't submit the first draft. There will be mistakes. There's this joke in um, in publishing, but also a joke in grant writing and in um, blogging and everything where you're putting your words out there. You notice the mistake as soon as you press submit or as soon as you press publish. So that's why you should read it a few times because you're going to catch mistakes or you're going to catch things that you could have worded a little bit better. Start to finish. Read it again. Um, especially important if there are multiple authors involved, maybe each author wrote a section. Do the transitions make sense? So if you're talking about microbial ecology for 800 words, and then you take a hard turn into synthetic biology tools, that might not make sense from the perspective of the reader, even if it makes sense to you. So build in that transition, um, explain why you're going to change topics, say how this relates to that. And then again, go back and figure out if you're missing anything. So the figure callouts we talked about, um, acronyms is sort of a sticking point for me. It's like a pet peeve of mine. But if you use acronyms um, extensively, especially in like in the introductory section, and you don't explain what they mean, and you don't define them in a glossary, your readers might not know what they mean either. And there's a difference in things like DNA, which everybody knows is common knowledge, versus things that are very specific for your field. And again, remember that what's specific for your field, you might know it really well, but somebody else might not. And then do you have all the required elements? So at Trends in Biotechnology, actually all the trends journals, we have um, we have highlights, we have outstanding questions, elements that are required. So this is journal specific, but make sure that you understand the journal requirements, go to their website, ask the editor, make sure that you have everything all lined up. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about revision. So you submit and you get the reviewer comments back and they're mostly positive and the journal is going to publish a revised version of your article. That's great. How do you do the revision? Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that the editor wants you to succeed. So if I've invited you to write a review or if I've accepted your proposal, um, I thought it was a good idea to start with. So we want you to be able to publish. We want the reviewers to like the revised version. And we're going to offer suggestions for how to respond to those reviewer comments. Um, if you've published before, I'm sure you've had the situation where reviewer one tells you to change X to Y and reviewer two tells you to change Y to X. And it doesn't seem like there's any way to reconcile these things. That's what we're here for. That's, that's why you talk to the editor. Um, really engage with what the reviewers say. This is so important. Um, don't just superficially respond to their comments and then call it a day. Um, sometimes the reviewers will say, like, the clarity of this entire manuscript could be improved, for instance, on line 107 and line 283. And then you'll, as, a, as an editor, I get these responses and they say, okay, here's how we change line 107. Here's how we change line 283. That's missing the point. You know, the reviewer wanted you to, to enhance the clarity and really improve the style of the whole thing and gave you a few examples. Um, don't just engage with the examples, but really understand what the reviewer wants you to do. Um, rewrite this whole section doesn't mean just like change a few words here and there. It really means top down, give it another go. Um, 
review manuscripts are not always sent back to the reviewers. It depends on the journal policy. Um, my own take on this is that if the reviewers have hyper-technical comments that I'm not an expert in and don't really understand, I'll send it back to them just to make sure the authors did what the, what the reviewers asked. If it's mostly more minor revisions, things like add more figures or um, make this part more accessible, then I might not send that for re-review. As always, just ask the editor if you have questions. So this is this is some key points here. Number one, a review is not a list of results. If I want you to take away anything from this talk, it's that. Only write a review <clears throat> if you feel like you have something to say. Um, if possible, submit a proposal before writing the manuscript. Don't just send the editor the whole thing or don't just direct submit the whole thing, but have a conversation early in the process. Make it clear why the topic is important and why you are the good person to write it. Know what journey you want to take your, your readers on. So this is something that one of my colleagues added. Um, it's a little bit more um, metaphorical. But again, this, this ties back to the idea of why are we writing this paper? What do we want the readers to learn from it they couldn't read just from the literature? Um, manage reader expectations. Again, this is probably not the only review or the only high impact publication, but why should they care about yours? Avoid jargon. Expect to revise that first draft. Follow the formatting guidelines. And remember, if, if you've been invited especially to submit a review, the editor really wants you to succeed. I want to spend a few minutes here talking about how review articles are peer reviewed, because this is really important. And I think that um, there's some misconceptions that reviews aren't reviewed, but they certainly are. Um, there's not a lot of good resources on the internet that I found for how to review a review. And so I really wanted to drive this point home too. So there are some similarities to research articles. Um, be professional, be objective. Don't be a jerk. Like don't, don't use the language in your review that you wouldn't want to read on your own paper. Um, the reviewer should understand what the journal is asking for, but you don't need to copy edit. You don't need to do like the line by line. Oh, like on this section, they're missing a period. Uh, they didn't italicize this organism name. Uh, they have a wrong subject verb agreement in this line. Don't do that as a reviewer. Um, like with anything, be forthcoming with the editor about conflicts. Um, and, and really, the reviewer's task in any scientific publication, I think, is to help improve the manuscript, not to give reasons why it shouldn't be published. So we don't need you to, to tear it down. We're not looking for a bunch of critiques. I mean, unless the science is not solid, we want to say, okay, here's what the authors have done. Here's how they can make it even better. Not, this is not what I would have written. You should reject it. Some differences though, um, good communication is important for any kind of, of scientific publication, but it's really essential for reviews because it's all about communication. Uh, you know, a research article is really a means to an end of sharing a, a finding, but a review, all you're doing is communicating. So make sure that your writing style is clear. Um, you know, there's no methodology. We talked a little about this at the beginning with the meta-analysis, but there's no statistics, there's no data analysis, no figures, no graphs, anything like that. Um, when you're thinking about novelty, you're thinking about discussion rather than results or experimental design. It's really important to distinguish um, field consensus from author opinion, and timeliness is a bigger deal. So, you know, even if a, a field isn't super pertinent right now, if you have a new finding, you can still publish it, but there might not be a good reason to, to publish a new review. What do decision terms mean? Um, you know, sometimes you'll see major revision. It's like, what is a major revision? Why do, why do we think about that? So, so here's some advice that I have. Imagine an average researcher who's interested, but she's not an expert. So can she understand the review? Does it give her an accurate and current representation of the topic? And will she learn something new from this review? So my advice to reviewers is if the manuscript meets those criteria as is, and really you can, you know, you can improve the language or the formatting or whatever, but it's good to go, that's, that's accept. Uh, if you see minor revision, that means the manuscript meets those criteria, but it could still be improved. Um, better figures, add some paragraphs, make some clarifications. I think of major revision as something that doesn't meet those criteria yet, but it could if you put some effort into it. And really the only one, the only reason that I'm looking for a reject decision 
is if the manuscript is so deeply flawed that it does not and can never meet those criteria. This is different from journal to journal, editor to editor, but I think this is how I like to think about decision terms. <clears throat> so I've got some more, um, here's the top 10 list again. So do be professional. Again, um, use the language in your, in your comments that you would not be offended to receive if somebody else made them. Um, if you're a PI or if you're um, supervising, maybe you're a postdoc and you have some students you're supervising, um, totally fine to invite them to contribute to doing the peer review as a teaching experience. Make sure the editor knows that. Do inform the editor of conflicts of interest. Um, one time I almost, I didn't quite do it, but I almost invited a, an author's wife to review his paper. Um, I'm glad that I avoided doing that, but there's no way I would have known that they were married. I just found that out um, incidentally, um, probably a month afterwards. Uh, if you're invited to write a review, don't commit to reviewing it if you can't meet the deadline, but you can always negotiate with the editor, um, inform the editor if there's, if there's an unexpected delay. If you can do it in three weeks, but you've been given two, just say, hey, I need three weeks, and I'll probably say yes. Um, pay attention to accuracy. I didn't talk about this before, but um, the reason that we're sending things out for peer review in the first place is because I'm not an expert on every single scientific topic in my journal. So I need your expertise, you, you being the reviewer, to make sure that we got the concepts right, make sure that we're citing the right papers, those sorts of things. That's really your most important task. Also comment on those other pillars, um, timeliness, clarity, accessibility, novelty. Don't feel compelled to line edit. You know, you don't need to add periods or commas. That's okay, we got you covered. Um, don't recommend re-review if you can't commit to reviewing the rise manuscript. So sometimes, you know, you'll have reviewers say, oh yes, this needs to be reviewed again. And then you send them the invitation to review again and they decline it. And it's like, well, if you didn't want to review again, why did you recommend that? As always, ask the editor if something isn't clear or if you need guidance. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to skip through this. But just to give you an idea of what some proposals look like. So we we'll usually get these things, um, you know, a few paragraphs in the journal's email box. And uh, you can see these, maybe we'll send around the slides later. Um, or if you're really interested in these examples, feel free to contact me personally. But um, when we're thinking about proposal evaluation, really it's what's missing, you know, would you invite it for submission? Um, if yes, what direction would you give the authors? And if no, could it be modified to get into that point? I'm sorry, we don't have time for this exercise. It's really a lot of fun, but it's um, uh, something we probably don't have time for right now. Okay, again, last point, when in doubt, ask the editor. So we're people too, right? We're not just the faceless representative of the journal. We are engaging in the community. We want you to succeed. Um, we've been there before. So every editor is um, a current or former researcher. We have written papers. We have struggled with obtuse reviewer comments. We have balanced all of those tasks we talked about at the beginning of being a lab researcher. But we're all different. Um, some of us are formal, some of us are informal. So maybe we most enjoy uh, building relationships with the community or technical communication or the science itself. You know, some of my colleagues are very passionate about like immunology. Um, some of us like to speak with a strong voice and lend our own perspectives to the, the research. Some of us want to let the journal reflect the community. We're here to help. It's in our best interest and your best interest when we publish the best papers possible. And it is literally my job to do whatever I can to help you as an author. So don't be afraid. Um, this doesn't just apply to me. This applies to any kind of paper you're writing. Uh, reach out to the editor, and the worst that's going to happen is they're not going to respond to your email, but most of them will, and most of them want you to succeed. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact me. So here's my email address, here's the journal website, uh, here's the journal's Twitter handle, and my LinkedIn. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions from people who are interested in writing reviews for my journal or any others. Um, I really enjoy engaging with the community. That's why I like getting webinars like this. Um, I love going to conferences, doing lab visits, meeting people in person, um, and explaining how I can help them. So please feel free to, to, um, to be in touch. I hope you've learned something. I hope that was useful for you. And I think we have a few minutes for questions.
Thank you so much, Matthew. Your presentation was really great. I learned a lot and it was very clear. We do have a few questions um, that came through from Facebook as well as the Q&A box. Sure. So the next question is, could you describe a bit about the type of person that could write a review article and um, do they need to be invited to write a review article? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, again, that's going to depend on the journal. Um, at the journal that I edit, either I invite you or you come to me with a proposal. We talked a little about those proposals. Um, so it can go either way. Um, if if I invite you, obviously I want you to, to write it, but that doesn't mean that you can't unless I invite you. You can always come to me with a proposal. We can always talk about it. The kind of person we're looking for to write it, that's a really great question. Um, so I want somebody with sort of boots on the ground, to use that idiom, um, experience in the research field. Um, whether that's running your own research lab or teaching a course on the topic or um, you know, being involved in setting policy, maybe you're in government or you're in an NGO or something. Um, Anything where you have had experience in this idea and, and you can add something to the literature. So what we're not, what we don't want is um, uh, I'm an investment banker and I want to write an article about CRISPR because I think CRISPR is cool. That's probably not the kind of person that we're going to invite to write it. But, um, you know, if you're a professor who, who uses CRISPR or if you are in um, government and you're writing regulations about CRISPR, those kinds of people. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what do you mean when you say we should include why you should write um, in terms of the review article, outlining your publishing history to justify the level of expertise? Yeah, um, I think those questions kind of go together. Um, so why you should write is, is that same idea of what your personal expertise is and what novel perspective that you can add that nobody else can add. Um, publishing history is one way to do that. So that's fine. And it, it's good if you publish a lot of papers in the topic, um, but it's not the only reason. So, you know, if you're a, a new professor, you're just starting out, maybe you haven't published that much in this field, you might still have a really great um, thing to contribute because you have recently set up your lab and you've thought a lot about what direction you want the research to go uh, and you're really intimately familiar with the most cutting edge stuff right now. So um, I think it's useful to explain that because maybe if I just look at your publication history through uh, Scopus, for instance, and I see, okay, well, you published six papers. I mean, that's fine, but you know what makes you an expert? But then you say, oh, well, okay, I just wrote this startup grant and I got all this money and I have recruited these students and I organized this conference symposium. And so I really know my stuff. I think um, the proposal is kind of your way to explain those sort of non, those maybe more qualitative qualifications. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's actually two questions related to this uh, in the same line of questioning. So the They've asked if a person needs to be affiliated to an institute in order to be a reviewer, or can it be an independent author, as well as can it be one author? Uh, yes, okay, so it certainly can be one author. Um, I've had a couple of really good um, articles recently by single authors. Um, it's it's a lot of work. You know, you're taking on a bigger um, a bigger project if you want to write it by yourself, but you can. Um, especially if it's something that you know really, really well. And if it's a more interdisciplinary thing, you know, maybe you want to invite that collaborator to lend their expertise too. But yeah, you can, you can do it by yourself. Um, what was the other part of the question? So uh, it, it just does the author, the reviewer rather have to be part of an institute or can it be an independent author? Oh, okay. So if you're talking about an author, um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be part of an institute as long as you have the experience. So, um, you know, if you're retired, for instance, that's an example, um, and you've spent the last 30 years working on this field and you don't do research anymore and you're just, 
you know, you're, you're, um, you're sitting on your couch and you're having a good time and you say, I really want to write this review article. Um, even if you don't have that, that affiliation anymore, sure, we can, you can still write that review. Um, and then for reviewers too, I think it's even less strict. Um, as long as you publish in this area recently uh, and know what you're talking about, yeah, you don't need to have any specific affiliation to review. Okay. Uh, thank you. Do you have any tips for identifying gaps in the research field? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of really great analytical tools out there. Um, if you're familiar with SciVal, so that's an Elsevier product, um, it's integrated extensively with Scopus. Uh, SciVal is one of my favorite things for identifying gaps. So they have really great visualizations for topics and topic clusters and how these things all fit together. And then you can see um, who is active right now and who might be a good author. Um, if you don't have access to that, uh, there's still plenty of ways to do this. There's um, uh, there's free tools. Dimensions AI is one. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about specific names of analytical tools. But really, the the easiest way that I evaluate this is to just go into Scopus and search for a topic, and then look at the number of research articles relative to the number of reviews. And if there's been a lot of research and not many reviews, that's probably a good a good place to start. Perfect. And um, just as a reminder, everyone, all of the Scopus tutorials and information about doing analysis on Scopus are available on the web the website that I put into the chat box. It hosts all of our previous webinar recordings. Perfect. So you can actually get more information on that uh, on that thing. Um, we do have a few more minutes. So what are the basic features of a Synthetic review. Not sure what you mean by synthetic. I'm sure, um, you meant systematic review. Sure. So it's a systematic review I'm less familiar with, but I would say the basic features of those are um, first defining a research question. So um, the what I always go back to think of is um, it may be in medicine. Does this intervention work? And then there's there's typically um, a rigorous database search. So you go to Web of Science and say, okay, I found these 4,000 results. And then you'll always see these figures in systematic reviews about inclusion and exclusion criteria. So here's how I decided which papers to, to take and which ones not to. Um, and then looking at those with some sort of uh, process to try to answer your question. Um, they're more centered around answering one particular question than giving your own perspective. Okay, perfect. There's a lot of questions about um, younger researchers because everyone says you've spoken a lot about looking for experience, researchers, expertise. Is there anything you can um, comment on for young budding trainee researchers? Anything Great question. That... Yeah, definitely. Um, I think probably the easiest way if you're interested in writing a review is to do it um, in collaboration with maybe a supervisor. Um, it doesn't even necessarily need to be the person whose lab you're in, but it could be um, a mentor or just somebody whose work you admire. Um, that also helps you to make connections and expand your own network. Um, if you know that your supervisor or mentor or somebody else has been invited to write a review, I think express your interest in collaborating. Um, and even if you're not at the point of being considered an author, maybe you've just started in the lab or something, you can at least help with the literature search, you can help designing figures, you can give comments on a draft. Um, so there's a lot of ways to be involved at any level of experience. And what I really like to do is I like to invite um, maybe people at like a senior postdoc or lecturer or young assistant professor stage to review. And then that helps you build up a relationship with an editor. So if you are invited to review and you give really insightful, um, important comments, then the editor has you in mind like, oh, this person really communicates well and understands the field well. Um, maybe I'll invite them to write a review later on. There's a lot more I could say about that, but in the interest of time, I think that's those are the, the key points. Thank you so much. And thank you for a great presentation um, and for answering the Q&A.
And we look forward to seeing you in other events for Africa soon, because I know there's been a lot of compliments that came through. There's still a lot of questions in Q&A. So what we can maybe do is reach out on email to those that we didn't get to. And to all the attendees, I remember that this recording will be uploaded onto the link that I put into the chat box. And you will be emailed um, the certificate link as well for attending this webinar. So thank you all for attending. Looking forward to seeing you in future sessions. And thanks once again to our presenter. Have a great afternoon forward, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.